Hello, in this book we are concerned with occupational fraud, embezzlement, corruption, and financial statement fraud. This is our chapter on financial statement fraud. It is chapter 15, and at 13 and a half thousand words, it is indeed the longest chapter in the book. So, we are going to start off with our overview, and uh, we have a bit of ground to cover. Financial statement fraud is an intentional misstatement or an omission from the financial statements. The goal is to deceive either about past or present future profitability or debt paying ability. The goals, one of the goals of internal controls are reliability of financial reporting. So financial statement fraud paramount to internal controls. An audit report is meant to raise the degree of confidence that users can place in the financial statements. External auditors are required to base their audit opinion on an audit conducted in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. Auditors need to obtain reasonable assurance as to whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements. Reasonable assurance is, is obtained when we have enough audit evidence to reduce the risk of an incorrect opinion to, let's just say, a small number. So, the auditors are there as one gatekeeper against financial statement fraud. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> both fraudulent financial statements and restatements occur, restatements are correcting past financial statements with a surprising frequency. During the audit, the external auditors discover errors and issues. They discuss these errors and issues with management. And management then decide whether to amend the financial statements or not. One of the um, requirement, one of the considerations would be how material, how large the error or misstatement is. Rather amazing, about 9% of all listed companies restated their financial statements each year from 2000 to 2014. So with all these safeguards, 10% restate, and indeed, uh, we might have more errors being discovered, but they are not um, made public through restatements. They would simply be a small correction applied in the current year without restating prior year. A small percentage, 0.1% of all companies issued fraudulent financial statements. These are the targets. Revenue recognition, tightly um, aligned with fraudulent financials. Other things were expense recording, liabilities, inventory, accounts receivable, and investments. The fraudulent companies were smaller than average Identifying fraudulent financial statements by analyzing the numbers alone is a challenge. Almost done with the theory. Way back in the 80s, Carlslow from New Zealand claimed that users place more emphasis on the first digits. He believed that a net income of 798,000 was seen to be worth much less than 800,000, even though in percentage terms it was only a little bit less. These round numbers, such as these targets like 800, might be targets to be attained by management, uh, might be thresholds for bonuses, might be a consensus earnings forecast. And so he believed that if the numbers came in just below one of these nice round number thresholds, management would make a little last minute rounding up. He used the frequencies of Benford's Law, even though in his paper he didn't call it Benford's Law as the expected digit frequencies for net income numbers. And he believed that evidence of the last minute roundup would be an excess of second digit zeros and a shortage of second digit nines. You see, what happens when we move from here to here is we change the second digit from a nine to a zero. And if enough people do that, we're going to have more second digit zeros than expected and fewer second digit nines. Let's look at some real data from 2018. So, 
These are quarterly reports, quarterly reported numbers for calendar 2018. So for most companies, it would be the first, second, third, and fourth quarter. I looked at the reported sales numbers. The data came from CompuStat, a beautifully conforming first two-digit graph. But when I look at the second digits alone, I do have extra zeros, but not fewer nines. So I think it's happening, but it doesn't look like it's exactly coming from here. Um, but maybe, maybe uh, some of the eights became nines and the sevens became eights and the six became sevens. So uh, it looks like it's happening, but it's not absolutely clear. Here we go again, net income numbers, a reasonably nice conformity for the first two digits, extra second digit zeros, but we don't have the shortage here. We have a shortage there and there. So it's somewhat consistent with this still happening. Let's have a look at Enron. Way back, Enron filed a Form 8R. It revised its results for 97 to 2000. Watch these headline numbers. Four of them, four of them, four of them. Revenue, 20.2 just made 20 billion, 31.2, 40.1 billion, just made 40, 100 billion point seven, just made 100. Net income, 105, 703, 1024. And in the year in which they gave me a messy revenue number, earnings per share, $1 and one cent, second digit zero. So I have seven, three, three, and one. Seven second digit zeros out of 12 numbers. The chance of that happening by chance are really slow. This is actually me. And this was um, towards the end of um, 2001. And uh, at that stage, there was a lot of activity in Enron's offices. The proverbial had in fact hit the fan. Now, if we go back here, It's in 2000, but Enron imploded in 2001. Let's have a look at their first quarterly report for 2001. Revenue, $50 billion, second digit zero, net income, 406 million. This is an amazing number. Watch the growth, 40 billion to 100 billion. Their growth was equal to, at the time, Microsoft plus American Airlines plus Nike their growth was equal to three public companies. Now they're at 100, and for the first quarter, revenue at 50. If we annualize this, we'll get revenues at $200 billion, which would have put them on par with Walmart for the year, the highest uh, revenue generating company in the world. Watch these headline numbers, second digit zero. Let's look at the second quarter, net income. 404 million, total revenue, 50.06 billion. The second quarter numbers are almost a carbon copy of the first quarter numbers. When I teach my classes, I avoid using words like carbon copy. They are quite dated. Nobody uses carbon to copy anymore. So here we go again. Now the end is close to being nigh, six weeks to go. Non-recurring charges totaling 1.1 billion after tax. Watch again, second digit zero. However, this is a write-off. And normally for write-offs, we would want this number to be smaller or to look smaller. So they should rather have gone 0.99. After a thorough review of our business, we have decided to take these charges to clear away issues. A $1.1 billion charge is not commensurate with clearing away issues. Well, Enron CFO Andy Fastow was the special guest at the global conference in 2013. Here we go. The end of the conference. It's Wednesday afternoon, 11.40 to 12.30. Andy Fastow, convicted fraudster, former Enron CFO. 
Here is Andy on the stage. Right there. This is a huge auditorium seating 3,000 people. And at the end, lots of people lining up. There's Fasto. Lots of people lining up for photos and the like and shake his hand and say hello. And um, so it, that was a very, very interesting conference closer. Let's have a look at Health South. And a few things come to mind here. Number one, we have spoken about Health South way back in Chapter 4. And um, we did talk about using Benford's Law. The point I want to make here is this was a massive fraud. Assets overstated by 2.7 billion. On this date, cash overstated by 370 million. It is rather amazing that you overstate cash. It's not the usual account to go for. Watch this. That balance sheet, the one just before December, 389 million dollars in cash overstated by 370 million there was actually only 19 million dollars in cash there and the audit report was unqualified this is myself and weston smith the cfo who uh, started it this is minnesota probably four years ago and we have to go back to chapter four. We talk about the entries kept below 5,000 to avoid detection. 126,000 fraudulent journal entries per quarter. If we annualize that, it's a half a million fraudulent journal entries per year. And indeed, this fraud, as uh, the next one, was carried out through journal entries. Worldcom. Uh, WorldCom and Enron were the two main um, reasons for the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. WorldCom started life as a company in 83. Discounted long-distance calls. In 1983, it was expensive to uh, place a call. Telephone companies had all sorts of rates for phone calls. It was expensive to call long-distance. The rates varied from 20 cents to 50 cents per minute. And indeed, if we want to get an idea of what uh, the cost would be in today's dollars, we have to multiply this by two and a half. So we get 50 cents to about a dollar 25 per minute in today's money. In 98, they acquired MCI Communications. Oh, and going back to this. Um, many of the young people uh, in, in my graduate and in my undergraduate classes probably can't remember when it actually cost money to call long distance. They paid 20 billion and took on 5 billion in debt. Long distance calls have essentially been free for some time now. This is a problem when your model is charging high rates over here in the mid 80s to the early 90s and that selling price essentially gets driven down to zero. The company overstated its net income and its assets. Improper journal entries. They used strange accounts. And one of the lessons learned here is that we had huge round dollar journal entries. Here's an entry for 334 million. Is an entry for 771 million. Indeed, in this report, they talk about the round numbers and they also talk about top side journal entries. Top side journal entries are journal entries that are done on spreadsheets outside of the books of account. They do not flow through to the um, journals of any of the subsidiaries, they are just made for presentation type changes. These are huge numbers, 560 million. Um, any of these should have raised serious concerns. Right over here, we have an interview with Cynthia Cooper. And if we uh, go up there, uh, that link will take you to Fraud Magazine, an interview with Cynthia Cooper. And she and her team came across this fraud. And she speaks about the challenges in actually identifying and making public fraud committed by top management.
Rounded numbers. This is another, just a sort of a bias, a little a little play, a ploy done by CFOs. This is still WorldCom. We could identify even less support for the last entry, which added 9.7 million, 9.75 million to revenue. Without the entry, pro forma earnings per share would have been 4532. And what would we do then? We would round it down and report earnings per share 45 cents. With the additional 9.75, the earnings jumped, it's not really a jump, uh, to 4552, but now we can round up to 46 cents, which uh, met Wall Street's projections to the penny. So here we are playing games with rounded numbers. Let's have a look at an example. Uh, this is one of the questions for the test in the end of chapter materials. The company had net income, weighted average shares. The basic earnings per share would be 0947, which would be rounded down to 09. And what happens when these numbers are small, this rounding down is quite a high percentage of that. It's about 5% here. So we really have this and we're rounding down by five uh, basis points to get to zero nine. If we want to be able to round up, we would need to do what? Well, D doesn't work at all. C doesn't work at all. The numerator in any fraction is the top number. So earnings per share is net income divided by number of shares outstanding, a is the answer. We would have to fraudulently increase the numerator, but just by a smidge. Now, we have a number of academics that have tried to use Benford's law to detect financial statement fraud. This was one of the first studies. And what they did was they looked at the first digits of a massive sample of financial statement data. They just took all the numbers reported and they looked at the first digits, and the fit to Benford's law is nearly perfect. Now the academic question becomes, so, the population follows Benford's law nearly perfectly. If I break that population into subsets, meaning the financial statements for each specific company, and financial statements might contain 200 uh, reported dollar amounts, at least in the database. So, I have about 200 reported numbers per company. If those numbers do not conform to Benford's law, or indeed the numbers that are the worst conforming to Benford's law, are they the most fraudulent? In fact, or we can say state differently, does non-conformity to Benford's law for a set of financial statements, is it a red flag for fraudulent financial statements? This author and a number of other ones claim that it does. However, two Australian researchers found a significant association, a link, between the number of line items, the number of numbers in the financial statements, and the mean absolute deviation. In summary, the fewer line items will give a higher mean absolute deviation. On average, or stated differently, the more line items the company used, the closer was the conformity to Benford, the lower was the mean absolute deviation. They say this is a highly influential factor. The accounting studies believe that they have found a relationship, but what they do is they don't look at individual companies, they partition their samples into groups. And these groups could be, for example, showed an increase in net income, showed a decrease in net income. And they look at the average mean absolute deviation for the group most likely to have manipulated. Is higher than the mean absolute deviation for the not so likely to have manipulated. Well, unfortunately, these mean absolute deviation averages are small. The differences are small. And these results could have been achieved by chance or could have been achieved by omitting other explanatory variables. These Benford-based studies do not offer any theoretical or practical argument as to why manipulation would turn a conforming set of financial statements 
into a non-conforming set of financial statements. So, if I have my income statement, statement of cash flows and balance sheet and the like, and now I'm manipulated, if I wanted to carry out a study that linked Benford's law to um, financial statement fraud, what I need to do is I need to have some solid basis for believing that when I manipulate, it moves the financial statements from wherever it is to a worse conforming situation. And those authors flat out don't do anything like that. They simply test it, um, making some assumptions. And I, uh, the best I can say is that I'm not thrilled with the result of this that research. Now, Benish, I like this. He developed an M score. I don't know why it's M, maybe M for Mark. And what he did was he looked at eight ratios. And he took a sample of fraudulent uh, companies, fraudulent financial statements, and he had a sample of good financial statements. And then he ran some statistics and he found that he could predict, he could use some uh, linear regression and he came up with an equation like this. And to cut a long story short, he found that the first four were statistically significant as well as, I think it was this one at the end, number eight. So, his four ratios here and number eight were helpful in predicting whether a company had committed financial statement fraud. What we see here is that these ratios are extremely logical. How high are the receivables compared to the sales? How high are your accruals? compared to your total assets. And accruals mean um, things like accounts receivable, accounts payable, including depreciation, some inventory accounts, and the like. So, to cut a long story short, Benish took a lot of time and came up with eight ratios, of which five were instrumental in identifying companies that had committed financial statement fraud, this is a well-cited paper, and it is extremely well executed. If it takes five reasonably serious ratios to predict or to, uh, to be associated with financial statement fraud, then going back to a simple first-digit graph sounds odd. If we need that level of complexity, then this a simple first digit graph and the mean absolute deviation is unlikely to cut it. Now, investigation steps. This is the seminal work on financial statement fraud. Gerard Zack, highly sought of in the industry. I like this book. It's an excellent read. Right around chapter 15, he talks about his detection and investigation steps, detecting financial statement fraud. And he starts off with things like, look at the tone at the top. How ethical do top management seem to be? What red flags are there that financial statement fraud might be committed? What internal control weaknesses would allow a financial statement fraud scheme to go through? He talks about things like, we could have the controls, but there might be something called management override. This is where the controls exist and they are overridden by top management. So it seems as if we have a control there, but management override would just sort of nullify that, um, that control. So I have about one page on um, investigation steps. I took um, Gerard Zack's list I adapted it, I edited, I cut it down, and the like. Um, if you want, if you want the real deal and you want the long version, this is the book to go to. So, 
Time for a summary. Oh, we have to do this one first, and then we're off to the races. This was an analysis that I did with a large public company, and what we were concerned about was whether the divisional controllers were sending up monthly reports that were fraudulent. So, I developed a, an equation, and it is something like scoring the forensic units, the ones that we did three chapters ago. Each set of financials from each division was scored, and it was scored using predictors. Those predictors had weights, and those predictors were calculated numbers calculated from the financial statements. So, we looked at sales, profits, variances, which you might recall from management accounting are a difference between the actual and expected, selected expense accounts, accruals, use of special selected accounts on the general ledger, accounts that probably wouldn't be used under any normal circumstances, the division's location, and prior risk scores. And in summary, I'm looking at numbers that are a large percentage change. I might be looking at numbers that are a large absolute change. I'm looking at numbers that move in a direction opposite to expected. So, for example, if sales go up, I would actually expect uh, expenses to go up, and I would expect those fixed overhead variances to move positive. I looked at numbers that were erratic. I looked at numbers whether they were just too smooth. And so, the details are in the book. You can look at it. We ended up with some 20-something predictors, and I thought at the end of that exercise, we did identify problem problematic sub subsidiary reports. Now it's time for the summary. When it comes to biases and these last-minute roundups, Benford's law works, and it works well. Enron showed us that they love to meet these thresholds. Health South's financial statements contain a massive overstatement of assets. And way back in Chapter 4, I talk about how Benford's Law might have detected that fraud. Just a reminder, um, Weston Smith in personal email told me <coughs> that the auditors continually asked for the data. They continually wanted to analyze it. And what he told them was that they were busy and that they would get it to them at some later stage. And the auditors accepted that um, explanation or that restriction. WorldCom. It was massive. It used massive multi-million dollar round number journal entries. And so auditors should be aware. Large round number top side journal entries. A big red flag. Strategic rounding up. And indeed, uh, the SEC made a point maybe uh, one or two years ago that they are investigating companies that habitually round up their earnings per share numbers. In fact, that they round them up many more times than what we would be expected by chance. Accounting studies claim that conformity to benefit of a company's financial statements is an indicator of fraud. Others, including me, question these findings. Benish, his M-score, uses logical predictors. If you wanted to use anything to do that, I would use his uh, formula. So, I also had an application where we used predictors, just like three chapters ago, to assess the risk of intentional or unintentional errors. So, we can detect some types of financial statement fraud Mainly these biases when, con when lots of different people round up strategically. We should have some red flags coming from the studies over here. But to simply be able to look at a number of ratios and to come up with something that indicates financial statement fraud, this is a good start. But I really do think that, and this study was done uh, years ago, I do think that it's much more complicated than even this is. Uh, looking at the financial statements numbers alone, difficult, very difficult. 
So I hope that has helped and I hope this is sort of put in context where we, sit, where we stand at the moment with the detection of financial statement fraud. That's all. Bye-bye.